In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, please come among us today as your faithful gather to talk about you, to learn about you, to learn about your sacred heart. Please send your Holy Spirit so that the words I speak will be only the words that you want spoken, that the words all here are the words that you want them to hear. And we pray that you will continue to guide us through our Lenten journey this year so that as you go through, as we commemorate your passion, death, and resurrection, we all recognize the many gifts you have given us. Amen. In the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right. Um, my name is Paul Van Hout. Uh, I'm a deacon candidate for the Archdiocese of Denver. I'm also a parishioner here at St. Scholastica. And one of the things that we have to do in classes is to give a presentation. And mine's on the Sacred Heart, as you can see. Um, some of us pray for vocations. And so tonight, you actually get to participate in a vocation, mine. Uh, one, one of the requirements of this class and of this uh, presentation is that we have these evaluations. And, and they ask that everybody do an evaluation. Um, Deacon AJ is a friend of mine. I went to a, a seminary with him in the first two years. I had to leave for four years for medical reasons, and then now I'm finishing up. But he became a deacon. He's from the Spirit of Christ, so uh, I'd like to welcome him here as well. Uh, there's pens in the box. Everybody gets a pen, so pick a color you like because you get to keep the pen. And so, and, and don't forget there's a little plastic thing on the tip that you got to take off there. Um, also, because uh, as you can see, it's being recorded tonight. And we have snacks in the, back, in the kitchen there, so if you need to get up and get a snack, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, the presentation should be about 45 minutes long. And because it's, you know, it's not that long, uh, I don't plan on having an intermission or anything. So, so this is it. So, this is, so we're going to do it one shot. All right. Uh, today we're talking about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And when I started into this project, I knew very little about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Really, this picture right here, or this picture here, is what I knew about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It was a picture. Uh, it was a nice picture. He always had his heart out. It was on fire. It looked kind of cool. But other than that, that's all I knew about it. Um, and I, I've probably spent 100 hours in the church praying to the tabernacle, not recognizing that there's a Sacred Heart statue above the tabernacle. I never saw it until a couple of months ago. So that's kind of my, my walking in um, to the Sacred Heart uh, present, or, uh, devotion. Uh, the theme of this talk, and I think the theme of the devotion, these are, these are kind of my impressions as I've studied this, it's going to be from what, what I would call a Catholic uh, verse in the Bible. It's Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. This is a very Catholic uh, phrase in the Bible. Our Protestant brothers and sisters will tell you that Jesus did all the work and we have nothing to do. Uh, but, this being a cat, but this verse in the Bible tells us we do have some things to do. And, and part of that is, is what we call redemptive suffering. And so there, that is a theme throughout this talk. And I think it's a theme that's uh, very present in uh, this devotion. Okay, Peggy, go ahead. All right, so there's, here's the outline. This is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to talk about the history of the Sacred Heart Devotion, which I didn't even know there was one. Uh, there's key players in history. I'm going to mention three, but there are several. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss some, but uh, due to time, we're going to talk about three. There's some papal encyclicals that are specific to the Sacred Heart. So some of the popes got involved, and, and they talked about the Sacred Heart. We're going to talk about the image of the Sacred Heart. And we've looked at the big image, which is Jesus. But we're going to talk about the heart itself, which is the kind of the unique part. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to practice this devotion. And then we're going to talk about how does this apply to you and me. So what is, what's the outcome of this devotion? Go ahead. So where and when was this started? It's kind of fuzzy, to be honest with you. A lot of people will tell you it, it started in the womb of Mary when Jesus' heart started beating for the first time. You know, some people will tell you it started on the cross when the soldiers 
speared Jesus in the heart. The general consensus is that it started in the late 1600s with uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. Jesus appeared to her and specifically asked for this devotion to be uh, put forth into the world. And so I'm kind of looking at it as that's kind of the official start of this devotion. There's definitely people before her that, that prayed to the Sacred Heart, but he, Jesus, came to her, uh, Margaret Mary, specifically to bring this devotion out. Um, there are some similar devotions to the Sacred Heart. The Divine Mercy, uh, which we have a picture right there, comes to mind quickly because of the water and the blood, the lights that represent the water and blood coming out of his heart. And, and if you pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, it talks about for the souls of, of uh, the whole world. You know, so there's this redemptive suffering um, theme as well in Divine Mercy. The other one that comes to my mind is Fatima, when Mary came to the children and asked them, will you suffer for the souls of others? And they said yes. So there's a, um, these two devotions, which are very popular, um, have this kind of same thread in, in, as I talked about the theme of tonight. Go ahead, please. All right, so the key players in history, uh, these are the three I chose, and there, and there are others. And what, what I'd like to keep an eye on is the dates. Uh, St. Mary Margaret, Margaret Mary Alacoque is late 1600s, and she kind of was the initiator, if you want to call it that. But there's some other devotions in these are 300 years prior to that. So uh, that's why I said earlier that it's not cut and dried as the exact day that this started. Uh, there are others that uh, had this devotion prior to the 1600s. So I'm going to talk about uh, St. Gertrude the Great a little bit first, talk about her life. And, you know, she, she's one that's kind of set the tone for Margaret Mary. She's the only woman to be called the Great by the church. And um, she entered the abbey when she was about six years old, probably as an orphan. It wasn't clear of, of how she got there so early. I mean, obviously, she wasn't becoming a nun, but she was in the orphanage. Uh, her mentor was St. Mactilda, uh, the younger sister of the abbot. St. Mactilda also had a devotion to the Sacred Heart and had some visions of the Sacred Heart. So not bad company to keep when you're six years old and, and not a bad mentor to have uh, uh, walking you through your faith journey. She was a, uh, St. Gertrude was an excellent student. She was brilliant. And she um, was very fluent in Latin and German. She was studying uh, St. Benedict, the rule, monastic stuff. So she was, she was very, she was very intellectual, almost to a fault. Um, she, they would even question her, her spirituality. She was so intellectual and so learned that she wasn't always keeping up with her spiritual growth in her prayer life. Um, and so, so much so that she was doubting her faith when she was 24. Well, Jesus came to see her when she was 25. And that was the end of that. And so he, he had a little talk with her. And so that was her conversion year. So she, okay, I got it, I got it. And he started, you know, she had several visions, or she had several visions of Jesus after that. And so much that he spoke to her directly in that she kind of even pushed her academics aside and kind of said, okay, that's not really my goal. This is now, this is what I'm after. <clears throat> her most famous uh, vision that she had with Christ was when she, when he was there and she laid her head on his chest and she could hear his heartbeat. So, uh, so that's a vision that she had. St. Matilda also had visions of Christ and, and his sacred heart as well. So, so just uh, the kind of company she's keeping is, this is top shelf uh, kind of upbringing she had. Uh, she kind of was given up on her academics, but Jesus said, no, no, I, would, I want you to write down what you've, encountered with me, these visions and so forth. So she did. She wrote those down in Latin. So that was her kind of her contribution at, at this level. St. Francis de Sales, uh, if you look at the dates here, he died just 25 years before St. Margaret Mary was born. So in church years, that's the next day. I mean, that's right away. I mean, the church years are like in hundreds of years. So, uh, so uh, St. Francis de Sales, um, he didn't have the visions that the ladies did. He didn't quite have that connection. Um, he did have a do uh, his devotion predated, as I just said. Uh, but he founded the order 
that uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque uh, was part of. And so he founded that order with uh, St. Jane Francis de Chantel. And so, and then his spirituality was throughout that order. So he kind of laid the groundwork, his spirituality kind of laid the groundwork for uh, what she uh, later um, learned and grew in spiritually. So he, that was his contribution. So St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, you almost need a, a warning label on this. She had a, such a unique, strange, difficult life. I mean, she, there's a lot of saints that I've studied that suffered a lot, particularly those that had the stigmata. They suffered for years from that. But this woman wanted to suffer. She looked for it. She thrived on it. It, it was, it, for Americans today, it's very hard to read this. I mean, she's just very, um, when she gets into it, she's just like all in and, and she can't suffer enough. So that's kind of my warning for this, for this lady. She's just very intense in this. Um, so she's kind of the key player that everybody looks to because Jesus specifically told her to start this devotion in some different ways. So she was born in 1647. She was very devout at a young age. And so she got sick when she was a real young. And the sickness, I, it didn't say what it was, but she was sick for like four years. So it was a real you know, problem. And she kind of had enough of that. And so she went to church and she talked to the Virgin Mary and she said, I don't want to be sick anymore. If you cure me, I will consecrate my life to you and to be a nun. And she's young. And so Mary said, okay. So Mary cured her. So now she's made a deal, you know, <laughs> with an angel, <laughs> you know. So, so she, um, she, so that's important in her life. Uh, and then shortly after that, her father died, and it left the po the family in kind of shambles. Uh, they poverty. The mother uh, kind of gave control of the money in the house over to some relatives that were kind of tough on them. And they just held him in poverty. So she lived in this life of poverty after her dad had died. And uh, she would say that she didn't always even have decent clothes to go to Mass. You know, she just had something to cover herself up with. So it, it was difficult. Um, and it was around this time when she started feeling this desire to um, have this redemptive suffering with Jesus. So she started at a young age desiring to suffer in the way of Jesus. Um, and then her mother got very sick. She's still very young. And her mother got very sick. And like her head was swelling up and they'd have to drain it. I mean, her head, it was, it was bad. And the doctor said, she needs a miracle. She's, she's not going to make it. She, and so Margaret Mary went to Mary and Jesus this time and said, I need a cure for my mother. And uh, they gave it to her. So that the, her mother was cured. And... So now that she has this connection with the divine and she's kind of getting what she wants, you know, she's in, now she's in. And so she's, she's at the Adoration Chapel all day, all night. She's um, not eating or drinking. I mean, she's a very all in kind of a person. And so when she's praying, she's all in too. And she was, she did this for a while. And then she, um, she started getting a little bit older. She started getting her late teens. And the men started being attracted to her. And she started getting um, requests for marriage. Remembering that she had promised to be a nun to our Blessed Mother. Um, so she, she was okay with that. But her mother was really pressuring her to get married. And part of that had to do with their poverty. She, her mother felt like if she were to uh, get married, then maybe she can get a stable life. And then maybe her mother can move in with her and... and kind of help, you know, get out of this burden of poverty that they're living in. And she was pushing on it pretty hard. Of course, the devil was too. He was, he was pushing on her to, to get married. And uh, obviously, she was fighting this contradiction. I mean, she made a promise to the Blessed Virgin. And she's got her mother, her own mother, is uh, pressuring her to do the opposite. So, um, so after a while, the pressure was a little bit too much from her mother. And she started engaging in the culture. She started going to dances. She started wearing nice dresses and getting uh, dolled up, if you will. And uh, she, was, she was doing this for a while, and one night she came home from a dance or something, some social event, 
And Jesus was waiting for her. And he appeared to her as though he just had got scourged. And he told her that what ha what's happening to him is because of you. He told her that what you're doing, the way you're living your life, is causing me this pain. And, of course, that woke her up. <laughs> I mean, that, that scared her pretty good. And, uh, but she's still kind of in this balance between her mother and, and her promise. And now she has Jesus telling her. So she, she's pretty conflicted. And uh, she started getting into um, self-mortification. She would tie herself up with ropes and chains so tight that she could barely breathe and eat. And she just started in this torturing kind of way of living. And, and, and it's so bad that if, when she liked to remove the chains, it would tear skin off of her body. I mean, she's just very, she's just a very intense person on, when she gets into something. And she did this for like four or five years that she just, she just, um, just like torturing herself. And Jesus appeared to her and said, okay, enough of that. Um, you are suffering, but you're suffering the way you want to suffer. I want you to suffer the way I want you to suffer. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how to do it. And he just, he just asked her to take on a, a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So he wanted her to become holy through those, not, not through this stuff she was doing. And so she got into the corporal works of mercy and she started you know, feeding the poor and, 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 and trying to attend to the sick. And <clears throat> she was, it was hard for her because, one, she didn't have any money to give to anybody. And two, she wasn't a nurse. I mean, she didn't really know how to heal anybody, but she was trying. And she had some conflicts with her family because they were like, you know, quit giving her stuff, quit giving her food away, you know. And she's, but she, you know how intense she, intense she is about these things. So she, you know, she had some struggles with that. And, um, and then finally, um, Jesus came to her again. And he said, told her, I'm going to consecrate you to my mother. And after that day, she um, lost her... She stopped feeling conflicted. She just says, all right, I'm not getting married. No, my mom, I'm just not going to listen to my mom anymore. I got a higher order talking to me now. And so with that, she found, started finding peace. And so she, she kind of got out of this rut of conflict that she was dealing with in her, in her young years. And then uh, Jesus came to her again, and he asked her for her will. He said, I want your will. I want your free will. I want you to give yourself to me so that I will tell you what to do in everything and you just do it. And she says, okay, I'll do that. So she gave away her will to Jesus. She, she freely gave her basically all of her freedom to Jesus. And after that, uh, then she entered the convent and she was in her early 20s. Um, when she's in the convent, she continued to do her self-mortifications, you know, maybe not quite as severe as she was doing but she was doing a lot of, she wanted to do the suffering, but she kept doing it on her own terms. And, and then Jesus had to step in again and say, no, no, I will tell you what to do. And now you got to keep in mind, she's in a convent. She has superiors. She has other people in there. And she's doing all this crazy stuff, you know, and so she's kind of making a scene. And Jesus said, just do what your superiors tell you. Be obedient. And if, if they tell you not to do it, you can't do it. So she got put under the authority of her superior. So now she's learning obedience. So she wants to suffer. She, she, she even is quoted as saying, the most pain and suffering I ever endure is when I can't suffer enough. I mean, that's the kind of mindset this girl's got. She's crazy. So, <clears throat> so uh, Jesus put a cap on it, said it's just what the superiors will allow. Um, and then, they, and then, it, then this is when it started getting interesting. He came to her another time and said, I want your heart. And she said, you can have it. And so he took her heart from her. And then he took it and he put it into his sacred heart and it consumed it. And then he put his heart into her. So he kind of switched hearts with her. But in her... <laughs> the way she lives her life. He said there's going to be a, there's some cost to this. He said on the first Friday of every month, that heart is going to hurt. You're going to feel it. It's going to hurt. He also said the night before, the Thursday night before the first Friday, 
you are going to feel the agony that I felt in the garden. So she is going to suffer, but it will be under his hand and under his direction. And she's accepting this willingly. Let's do it. So she's, she's all in. And so um, I, I can't remember if this was the same apparition or, or the next one, but this is when he asked for the, his special feast day. He asked for the feast of the sacred heart. Um, and, he, and, he, and he told her it's for the uh, reparations for the indignities to the Eucharist. So uh, this is kind of this, um, he, his heart is pierced when we disregard the Eucharist, when we disrespect it, when we're, then when we're indifferent to it and outright hostile to it, which many people are. And these hostilities and things that we do to his Eucharist, that is his greatest gift, it is painful to him. And he's asking people like Mar Mary to suffer in reparations for that, for somebody else. And that's kind of the theme that we talked about early at the beginning, is which is, is this sacrificing for others. And, and tying your suffering to the cross of Jesus, the passion of Jesus. So he's asking her to do that. And she's saying, let's do it. So she's all in. Uh, but she didn't know how to make a feast. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't make that decision. So she asked for some help. And, and he gave her a confessor. Father de la Colombier was her confessor. And he was the one. He was a conduit to the Vatican. Um, but as the church goes, uh, it took... Uh, so the feast was approved in 1856. So that's like 200 years later or 150 years later. So, so he, he did get the ball rolling, but these things take time. And so he did get his feast. Now, that's when it was officially the feast for the whole church. There were some other spots where the Pope allowed it. But before it became universal, it was almost 200 years. So, so after that... Uh, she came, became very sick again. She was, she was sick a fair amount. Of course, she, the way she lived it didn't help, you know. But um, her superiors were, they're questioning what's going on, you know. This, she's, what's going on with you, you know. And her superior told her, go to Jesus and ask him to cure you for five months. Perfectly cured for five months. And then we'll know it's from Jesus. And if, if that doesn't happen, then it's from the devil. So she went back to Jesus and said, my superior asked for me to be cured for five months, and he did it. So she was good for five months. It was probably her worst torture of her life to, be, to feel good in the morning. I mean, that just, that's the way she was. So, um, so, so you know, these miracles are happening, and they're, and they're obvious, and they're, and they're even being requested and so forth. So, um, so she was a very holy woman, but, you know, very willing to do anything for Jesus. Uh, one more apparition, uh, Jesus came to her, and he was as though scourged again. And he asked her, he said, I don't want you just to carry the cross like I carried the cross. I want you to be nailed to it like I was nailed to it. And, and she said, fine. So that's kind of the life of Margaret Mary, who is the um, conduit of the Sacred Heart devotion to the world, but that's the kind of life she lived. I mean, I don't know. I look at it and I think, Jesus just wants an outstanding example, just an extraordinary example of, of suffering like he suffered, because he got it in her. She died at the age of 43 in uh, 1690, and she was canonized in 1920, quite a while way later. Okay, Peggy, go ahead. Okay, the papal encyclicals. So there's, I have picked three papal encyclicals, three uh, writings that popes have written over the years um, about the Sacred Heart devotion. And again, if we look at the years here, 1899, 1928, uh, 1956, you know, 1899 is Pope Leo XIII, who's a pretty famous pope. 1928 is between the world wars and right before the uh, Great Depression. And then 1956 is interesting because that's after the Divine Mercy. It's after uh, uh, Faustina, Faustina's life. Now, 
As you know, it takes a long time for divine mercy and all of these things to become official. Actually, divine mercy officially was stamped by John Paul II. So, you, so I, I mean, he leaps frogs these things, but you can kind of see how this, this timeline flows of, of what's going on while these, these things are happening. So the first one is uh, uh, Anum Sacrum, the sacred year, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, And his focus of this encyclical was for the consecration of the whole world to the Sacred Heart. So he was looking at it more of a macro level. He stated that uh, Jesus is the head and supreme Lord of our race. So he's trying to remind everybody that his Sacred Heart, Jesus Christ, is the Lord of the entire world. Um, he also recommended that we do personal consecrations as well, but his main focus was the whole world. Uh, he told us that by consecrating ourselves to him, we not only declare our open and free acknowledgement and acceptance of his authority over us, but we also testify that if what we offer as a gift were really our own, we would still offer it with our whole heart. So what he's saying is what we're giving Jesus was something we got from him to begin with. So it, he's just reminding everybody that uh, to return this to Jesus is great, but you got it from him to begin with, just so don't forget that, you know. Uh, there was one funny statement in this encyclical. I just, I liked it, so I, I brought it along. Um, he said, God has left them the prey of their own evil desires so that they give themselves up to their passions and finally wear themselves out by excess of liberty. And it just, didn't that just speak of today? You know, everybody just wears themselves out with their liberty of, I can do what I want. So anyway, that, that passage just struck me. I, I had to throw it in. All right, the next one is uh, Pope Pius XI, um, the Most Merciful Redeemer, 1928. So this is uh, after World War I, the 20s were a little crazy, a lot of partying going on leading up to the Great Depression. Uh, his emphasis was on reparations to the Sacred Heart, uh, and he wanted to breathe new life into the devotion, you know, remind people. Um, he's looking at the decline in morality in the world at that time. Everybody was, World War was over with. Everybody's partying a little bit too much. Um, he considered it a duty to bring about satisfaction or reparation, which must be rendered to the most sacred heart of Jesus. So he, he for the faithful, it was like a, a duty. We need, us faithful need to provide reparations to the sacred heart of Jesus for all, the, all that's going on right now. There's very little devotion to his, his Eucharist, his sacred heart, and he wants the, the rest of us to bring about these reparations. And in this encyclical, he, he brings up Colossians 1.24, which I mentioned at the beginning, about uh, redemptive suffering. Um, and he, he asks that men should approach the altar with this purpose of expiating sin, making what is called a communion of reparations. So that's along the lines of... of First Friday devotion, which we're going to talk about, the uh, feast day of Sacred Heart. Uh, so when you, one of the things you do is, is receive the Eucharist on that day, and he's asking us to do that as a communion of reparation. So there, when you are observing the feast, that should be on your mind. I'm doing this, Lord, to show you our gratitude for those that show ingratitude. So... So that's, uh, so his basic message was, we got to clean up our act. We're, this place, this thing's going bad. The last one is uh, Pope Pius XII. Uh, you will draw the waters, 1956. Uh, his emphasis was on the devotion to the Sacred Heart, obviously. Uh, he was similar to his, his predecessor to bring, breathe new life back into this devotion. He was the first one that mentioned, <clears throat> he was the first one to mention that, excuse me, I'll get a drink. He was the first one to mention the, the decline in the devotion, that people weren't doing it. They were starting to forget about it. So you want to wake, wake us up to that. Um, <clears throat> he wanted to remind us about the many uh, graces that flow from this devotion, so you know, that are poured out when you, when you observe this devotion. He also tied it to the Eucharist. He tied his passion to the Eucharist which isn't always clear or isn't always on our mind, isn't always on my mind anyway, um, the direct tie between his passion and the Eucharist. And these are two, maybe the, arguably the two greatest, maybe other than our salvation, gifts from Jesus to us is his passion, which brings about our salvation, and the Eucharist, which is our food for the journey. So 
he tied those very tightly together. They're almost inseparable in this encyclical. And then also, he also brought forth the notion of love God and love your neighbor, the two greatest commandments. So when we do these reparations for somebody else, that's our way of showing, number one, that we love God. Number two, that we love our neighbor because we're going to make this sacrifice for our neighbor. Do you, Peggy? All right, this is the uh, heart of the Sacred Heart image. I mean, the Sacred Heart image is, for me, it's like every time you see Jesus not on the cross, it seems to be the Sacred Heart picture or the Divine Mercy. I mean, it's, we're so common. It's, we see it so often, I don't even think about it anymore. But there are some important features about the heart, which is the unique part. Uh, typically, it's on fire. Um, obviously, representing his love for us, his, his burning love for us. The crown of thorns, in this picture, it's vertical. Sometimes it's horizontal. Those are piercing his heart. Those are our sins. So those represent the many sins and, and indignities that we give him, which pierces his heart and causes him pain. Um, the cross above, of course, is his sacrifice for us on the cross. And then in this picture, we have a spear piercing his heart. Sometimes the spear is there, sometimes it's not. But generally, there's the hole in his heart is present. So these are there are there are no commissioned images by the by the Vatican. So that's why they vary so much. People artists can, you know, kind of do what they want. So there's no uh, Divine Mercy has a particular image that was uh, asked for by Jesus, but not not the Sacred Heart. So these are kind of the common things you'll see. And that's what they uh, represent. Okay, Peggy. All right. Here are some ways to practice the Sacred Heart devotion. Um, the feast day of the Sacred Heart is the Friday after Corpus Christi. So you have, you have uh, Pentecost, and you have uh, Trinity, and then you have uh, Corpus Christi. Those are Sundays. And then that Friday is... Sacred Heart, the Feast of the Sacred Heart is a Friday. So it's not a holy day. You have to actually look for it. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be a Sunday where it's automatic. Uh, it's a Friday. So it's something that you have to consciously look at and say, Lord, I'm going to um, be part of the feast. He specifically asked for this feast day on that day. So this is Jesus Christ saying, I want my feast day on this day after Corpus Christi. So uh, very specific, came straight from Jesus to Margaret Mary Alacoque. And so that's the, uh, the feast of the Sacred Heart. Uh, also, uh, so this year it's June 16th. So it does move around because Easter moves and Pentecost moves. But it's June 16th this year. Uh, and also the month of June is dedicated to the Sacred Heart um, throughout the church. So uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we need, what he's asking for us is to attend Mass and make an act of reparations specifically for the Eucharist and the dis disrespect that the Eucharist sees. So on that feast day, we need to uh, go to Mass and um, um, make a consecration of reparations of some sort for the disparaging of the Eucharist. Um, the next one is the images of the Sacred Heart in, in your house. Uh, there's 12 promises. I don't have them all with me right now. But there's 12 promises that Jesus made to Margaret Mary. And uh, this is the ninth one. And it says, I will bless every place in which an image of my heart is exposed and honored. So that's um, Jesus specific, specifically talking about images in, in your house. Uh, the next one is uh, Eucharistic adoration. Uh, many of us go to adoration already. I mean, we, like we have our day of adoration or whatever we have. But this is a specific day of adoration where you go there to pray for all the indignities and to show gratitude. So there's the Eucharist itself. You're saying, I'm here, Lord. Uh, I'm, show, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm grateful you gave us this gift. And so that's, that's what he's asking for there. He's very, uh, he mentioned to, to Mary, Margaret Mary that people that uh, visit the, go to adoration is very pleasing to him. Um, the Nine First Fridays devotion. Now, I didn't bring this up at the beginning, but when I was younger, I vaguely, I didn't know anything about Sacred Heart, but I vaguely remember something about First Fridays. I don't remember what it was. I just remember First Fridays was something. You know, and then Divine Mer or then the Fatima came along, 
And Mary got us off on First Saturdays, you know, so we're doing First Saturday devotion. So I kind of forgot about First Fridays. But it's here. And uh, uh, Jesus said to Margaret Mary, he said, I promise you in the excess mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Fridays of nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace, nor without receiving the sacraments. My divine heart shall be their safe refuge in this last moment. So that's the nine first Fridays devotion. And, and, and just kind of reiterate, uh, if you receive Holy Communion on each first Friday, they need to be consecutive. And you make this, uh, must be made in honor and reparation for his sacred heart. So for all of these first Fridays and the, and the feast day, it's all about uh, being there to show Jesus that we we, have, we are gracious for what you've given us, and we will do what we need to do to give, bring reparations for those that don't. Uh, the act of consecration, there's different forms of it. Uh, Mark, Mary had one. Uh, some are longer, some are shorter. Some of them are kind of intended for once a year, like maybe on the feast day. Uh, there's real short ones that you can make every day. Uh, I've been making the longer one. Uh, interesting, the, the five first... Friday is interesting. When I started this uh, study, I looked at the calendar and there were nine First Fridays from that day till ordination. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess we're doing nine First Fridays. So, uh, so this consecration is something that you can do on those Fridays or anyway. So there's a there's some different forms of this consecration, but there's a consecration prayer uh, for that. The litany of the Sacred Heart. Uh, there's it's one of six approved litanies. Uh, it contains 33 invocations for the 33 years that Jesus lived. And there's a partial indulgence for that. Um, and then the novena for the Sacred Heart. There's many novenas out there. Um, this particular novena is recommended that it ends on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. So it would be a June novena that you would do. Okay, Peggy. Okay. Um, so how does this apply to us? The, the top of the ladder, the highest rung of the Sacred Heart devotion is, is Christ's love for us. I mean, that's what he's, his heart's out there. He's showing it to us. He's given it to us. Uh, that's the top. But what we learn in studying this and looking at his apparitions and what he told the saints is that because it's out there, it can be hurt. We can hurt it with our sinfulness. It's, it's exposed. It's vulnerable. So it's, it's for us, it's given to us, but it's also exposed. And for the people that have ingratitude, that causes him pain in his, in his sacred heart. Uh, and so we provide reparations, and that ties off that earlier theme that I said about redemptive suffering, when we suffer for the indignities of other people and ourselves. So he actually wants us, this is part of the devotion, is, is this notion of praying for other people. Now, I'm not good at that. I mean, I... If somebody calls me, oh, so-and-so has cancer, I'll pray a novena or pray a rosary or something. And it's usually for me or for somebody I know or somebody asks me to do it. But it's not often that I go off and say, okay, I'm going to pray for some guys I don't even know or these, these guys out in Germany that are doing crazy things. And, you know, it's not often that I just think of a total stranger and I say, I'm going to pray for them. Lord, I'm going to uh, pray a novena or a rosary for the people that are hurting you. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that way. But after studying this, it kind of, it's kind of like Jesus saying, no, you need to think that way. And so that's, that's one of the kind of learning that I, I took away from this. Uh, and as we make these sacrifices, you know, that's where we become like Jesus, making sacrifices for other people. I mean, that's what, when he was packing that cross, he was doing that for other people. He wasn't doing that for his sins. He was doing it for our sins. So he was, he was showing us the way. The Eucharist is a source of joy. For Jesus, when we go to adoration, he loves it. He loves us to go to adoration and spend time with him. But it also is a source of pain if it's disregarded, you know, disrespected, ignored, um, and in some ways even abused. So these are kind of some of the learnings, uh, you know. The, I guess, the, I guess the, what, I, what turned me in studying this devotion is the thought of praying or doing reparations for other people. It's just not on my radar. It's not something I think about, but it's something I think about now. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Are there examples of, um, of 
people disrespect or disregard the Holy Eucharist in like an adoration or? Well, if you just think about the, the communion line, you know, if somebody's chewing gum, you know, somebody's checking their phone on their way up, you know, they just grab it and stick it. Some people are in the pocket, you know. So there's, and then you got the extreme examples of satanic people that take it home and truly disrespect it, have a black mass and, and dis truly, truly disrespect it. But if you just think about the, um, the lack of uh, the dignity that it requires as you go up to Holy Communion, there's a lot of people that don't do that. And, it, and it's, well, if you look at the numbers, 70% uh, of the people don't believe it's a pure, the real presence, and, and they, they act like that. It's just something they do, they walk through and they go back. So that's, that's what we're talking about, a, a, an indifference to the, to the Eucharist. Okay, so in summary, um, we talked about the history. Um, it's a little foggy, but it's kind of nailed down for, with Margaret Mary. Uh, the key players, I just brought up three. There are some other very big players in this that, uh, that are also out there. Uh, the papal encyclicals, the popes are definitely on board with this. They are trying to promote this de uh, devotion. The Sacred Heart image, you know, we can see in it, when we look at it now, we can see that what, what it means and what it can mean. Uh, we talk about different ways to practice this devotion. And, um, and then how it applies to us, I might have been a little selfish there, it's kind of how it applied to me. <laughs> I mean, it's what, what struck me as I studied this thing. So um, that's just some things that uh, uh, came to my mind as I, as I studied this. So that's all I have. Um, does anybody have any other questions about the Sacred Heart? Why did you choose this template? Actually, it was chosen for me. And I was looking for a particular topic that I was interested in. And the formator said, no, you need to work on yourself a little bit more. I was looking at a little out here. Kind of this. My, my, my desire was to talk about the division in the world and how we can bring people together. So kind of those, those people out there and how we can be more, you know, not fighting, not hating, but, you know, we can think differently, but we can still love each other. And they said, no, that's out there. You need to work here. And so it was actually, uh, they thought this would be, this is what you need, which I did. <laughs> so thank you. I just find it interesting, um, and maybe you can't answer this, but Jesus appeared to St. Faustina scourged after she went to a dance. <laughs> <laughs> Did I, I don't know if I think I skipped that part. She came home that day, and he told her that, you know, this is hurting me. And she called her clothes. Give me a second. My, where are they? Hang on. These are those accursed liveries of Satan. That's what she called her clothes. <laughs> These accursed liveries of Satan. That's what she. That's what she. So she. She got the message when when he showed up. But the, but it's interesting the dates. That's why the dates are kind of important. Um, you know, there's a the question I had burning in my mind as I was studying this is why do you need two devotions? I mean, what's wrong with divine mercy? It seems to be working fine. Um, the answer was that. These devotions and these visits from Jesus, they come at particular times in history. Uh, the Sacred Heart devotion when he came to Mary, uh, Margaret Mary um, was after this uh, Jansian uh, heresy where they were painting G or God as a mean, uh, tyrant, hateful kind of a guy. You know, almost from a, maybe not an extreme sense, but from a Muslim point of view of God, he's up there, he's not our God. He's not my father, I can't call him father. I can't, he, I don't, can't have a relationship with him. I just sit here and do what he tells me to do. You know, and so that was going on. And so this, I think part of it was Jesus saying, no, I do have a heart. You know, I do love you. We are in relationship. So, so during that time, that was what, the, what they're after. You know, and then uh, Faustina, you know, that's between the wars. Um, you know, so the, so the devotions are reintroducing them because there's similarities. But also it's a different tone for a different time. And so that's why you might have these different devotions coming. You know, uh, Fatima was right in the middle of all that. You know, Fatima was between them, you know, and Fatima was actually pretty close to Faustina. Right. You know, so, you know, Mary's coming, Jesus is coming. I mean, there's a lot going on here because things falling apart, you know, and he's, he's trying to come in and 
straighten the right the ship, you know. So, um, yes, sir. Was this a, is the, is the sacred heart of, the sacred heart devotion? When did it actually go worldwide? Was it with the Pope doing the encyclicals, or was it before that? No. And then, um, is it still? Is this something that's still observed worldwide? Absolutely, the, the, the feast is. Um, I have it wrote down here. Uh, when she got the, um, I wrote it on here for because I think I knew you were going to ask that question. So, um, when she got her cohort, there it is. Uh, when she got Father de la Colombière, he was driving the getting the feast day set up. It was approved worldwide in 1856, 200 years later, almost. And so, and that, and now it's, uh, and it got, it became a first class feast, I believe. And so, you know, sacred, it's not a uh, holy day of obligation, but it's still a solemnity of feast um, worldwide. So it is, it is universal. Okay, do people in China have these little prayer cards with things about the devotion and the nine Fridays and all that? Do they have that there too? Or is it just in like European countries? I don't know that. I don't know that. But it is universal, so it, it certainly should be available to them. Can it be in like the Philippines or Mexico or? I would assume it is. All those places, yeah. Yeah, it's coming, from, it's coming from the Vatican and it's approved throughout the world. Is it observed the same way universally? No, no. I was just wondering how, I mean, it's, it's one thing when somebody says st stuff like, well, this can apply to everybody. Okay, great. Everybody says, yeah, great. Okay, got it, whatever. But it's another thing when there's the, uh, the kids at the uh, religious ed school who are getting holy cards of the Sacred Heart. It got down to that level. It got, it got that saturated worldwide. Any, any idea on that? I, my, well, my, I would just offer my own experience. I knew nothing about the Sacred Heart. When I started this, nothing. I went to Catholic school for eight years, and I knew that. I knew the picture. I'd seen the picture a bazillion times. That's it. I didn't know anything about Margaret Mary. I didn't know about the feast day. I don't think I even knew the feast day. Um, so I, that's... Sacred Heart, like, converts here? Like, where everybody from all the parishes meet and... I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, any more questions? Um, so, last year it was on the day that Roe v. Wade was overturned, I think. Right? Uh, you might be. You might be. And I just find it interesting, and maybe I just don't know enough, but when they had the, all the Eucharistic miracles, it seems like when they examined them, it's heart tissue. Mm -hmm. Is there one that's not heart tissue? Not that I'm aware of. And, yeah. and, the, and the blood type's all the same as far as I know. I mean, I can't say I'm an expert in this area, but that's, my understanding is the blood type's the same and the, you know, it's a heart, it's a live heart, yeah. those types of things I've heard, so. Any other questions? All right. Father, do you want to lead us in prayer, or do you want me to do it? <laughs> I had a wild. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together to talk about you, to get to know you better, to fall in love with your sacred heart. Pray that you'll continue to bring about change in the world that is pleasing to you, that shows you our gratitude for your many gifts to us. And we pray that you will be with us always. Amen. And Father and Son, Holy Spirit, amen. All right. Thank you. Thanks for coming.